Well, good morning, Liberty. Uh, thanks for inviting us into your living rooms once again this morning. We are excited to worship with each and every one of you. Uh, I love this first song. We're going to sing a couple songs, and then uh, Dale's going to come and pray with us. Uh, but I love this first song, Multiplied. I love the chorus. I love the words. Um, God of mercy, sweet love of mine, I have surrendered to your design. May this offering stretch across the skies, and these hallelujahs be multiplied. Let, let that be our prayer and our heart this morning as we sing together. And your love is like radiant diamonds and bursting inside us we cannot contain and your love will surely come and find us like blazing wildfire singing your God of mercy, sweet love of mine, I have surrendered to your design. May this offering stretch across. Your love will surely come and find us like blazing wildfire, singing your name, God of mercy, sweet love of mine, I have surrendered to your Across the sky, and these hallelujahs be multiplied. all of our hearts, Lord. We just pray that you will prepare us for the message you have for us today. And Lord, we just thank you for all that you provide us. We lift up your name in Jesus' name. Amen.
Good morning. My name is Dale Hodgel. I'm an elder here at Liberty. Um, something we do at Liberty is we spend some time in corporate prayer uh, where we gather together and we uh, lift up our burdens, lift up our requests, as well as our praises uh, for answered prayer. So would you pray with me this morning? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning that we were able to worship you and hear from your word. Uh, Lord, we confess that daily we sin in many different ways, but as it says in the passage from this morning that Jesus, he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for our sins, but also for the sins of the world. Lord, we thank you for that great gift that you get, have given to us through the sacrifice of your, of your son, Jesus. Lord, we pray for continuing comfort and strength for Pau Kroll in the upcoming days and weeks. We pray that she would feel your healing love as others come alongside and encourage her. Lord, we also lift up Danita Hunt, Hannah, as she moves to Kansas City. We pray that you would go before her and give her guidance for future plans. We also pray for Larry Rosa as he waits for a date for his back surgery. We pray that his pain would be manageable and that the wait would be short. Father, we pray for our missionaries that we support around the world, that you would protect them, but also um, present them with opportunities to reach people they might not usually be able to, give them boldness to, pro to proclaim your gospel. Lord, we all, lastly, we, we pray for our country. With uh, the fear and uncertainty we've seen over the last few months from the virus as well as the social unrest over the past couple weeks, we pray that this would be a time of people turning to you for their hope and salvation. All these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, Liberty E Free family. Those of you who are still at home and watching online this morning, um, we've got an announcement for you today, June 14th, will be the uh, last Sunday that we do the morning online uh, service. Um, we've done this for 13 straight mornings, so that's pretty amazing. But uh, we will still be doing an online service. You just will not be able to tap into it on Sunday mornings. Uh, rather, um, after today, you will be able to go to the uh, online uh, website and uh, be able to access the service in the afternoon. So keep posted. We'll give you some more information on that. But today is the last time that you'll be able to go in the morning and uh, see our online service. I want to start off this morning by showing you a picture. And it basically is a picture of a, a lightning bolt, but it's an unusual looking lightning bolt. And this was an actual picture that someone took of this lightning bolt. And when it was put online, it all, almost went viral. And the reason is, if you observe that lightning bolt real closely, it looks like uh, the state of Wisconsin. So it was, became referred to as the Wisconsin-shaped lightning bolt. The picture was taken by Jerry Zimmer. Let me give you the background behind him and behind how he took this picture. Uh, Jerry Zimmer is a professional photographer, um, and he loves taking pictures of lightning bolts. He has spent more than 25 years on top of dark hilltops face-to-face -face with approaching thunderstorms, hoping to get a good photo of a lightning bolt or several lightning bolts before the wind and rain will drive him back to his car. In June of last year, Zimmer uh, was determ determination paid off with a photo of a lightning bolt that resembled the outline of the state of Wisconsin. He says, The night I took that photo, there were four or five storms coming towards me from the north. What I usually do is I go home, look on my computer, look at the radar, and try to figure out how close a storm is coming, or if I should go and chase it. He said it is often a balancing out. If the storm is too far away, the lightning bolts are too small for the photo. However, obviously getting too close to the storm presents a different sort of problem, like uh, getting struck by lightning. This is a very scary hobby to be a part of, Zimmer says as he laughs. I have had some very close calls because of this. In fact, there have been some times when I have heard a loud sizzle sound even before I actually saw the lightning bolt, that's how close the lightning was to me. But hey, you don't get these kind of shots by staying at home. The night he took this particular photo of the Wisconsin lightning bolt, 
he held the shutter speed uh, open for 21 seconds. The storm was moving very fast towards him, so he was only able to take three photos before he had to quit and run to take cover. He says, I went home, put the photo on my computer screen, and thought, hey, that's a pretty cool picture. So then later, I posted it on Facebook, and a guy I work with said, hey, that lightning bolt looks like the outline of the state of Wisconsin. And that's when it took the title, the Wisconsin Lightning Bolt. The photo has been shared thousands of times around the internet. This photo and other photos of lightning have been used on television weather reports in the Twin Cities, Milwaukee, Madison, and other locations. Zimmer adds, my mom really hates me chasing after these thunderstorms. I never tell her when I'm out shooting photos in a storm because I believe she'd be too scared. But, but this photo was getting so much publicity and being seen in so many places, I knew that eventually she was going to find out. So I went ahead and told her. Now, with all the publicity that this one has received, I, I got with this photo. She wants, to make, wants me to make a large, extra large print of it so that she can hang it on the wall in her house. This is a hobby of patience, Zimmer says. I don't get a whole lot of sleep on stormy nights. If I hear thunder, I get up, go to the computer to see where the storm is. And when storms first develop, that's when you get the best pictures. And then he closes with this line. Listen to this. It's when the storm first develops, that's when the power is really on display. That is when the power is really on display. Um, a few weeks back, we started a series where we're going through the book of 1 John, the New Testament book. And last week, we went through uh, the uh, verses 5 through 10. And verse 5 says this. John is writing, This is the message we have heard from him, referring to Jesus. And this is the message that we proclaim to you. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. God is light, in him is no darkness at all. And basically, John is uh, saying God is light to basically give us a good description of who God is, a description of his character, and a description of his essence. Uh, the Christian life always begins with God. And when John is basically saying God is light, he is saying this is the essence of who he is. And we see this throughout the, uh, the scriptures dozens and dozens of times. Both God and Jesus, the Son of Man, refer to themselves as light. Psalm 27 says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my stronghold, whom shall I be afraid? Psalm 36, for with you, O Lord, is life's foundation. In your light, we will see light. And then Jesus picks up on the light theme as God being light. When he speaks, he said this in John chapter 8, I am the light of the world. Anyone who follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life within them. John chapter 12, Jesus also said, while you have the light, believe in the light so that you may become sons of light. And then in John chapter 12, verse 46, I have come as a light into this world so that everyone who believes in me will not remain anymore in spiritual darkness. And so God is light basically describes that God is perfect. He, he is absolute perfection. He is holy. He is pure. He is absolute light, no darkness. In him there is no stain, no speck, no shade of imperfection. Uh, he will not leave sin unpunished because sin is darkness. And so sin is an abomination and he will not let sin into his presence. In Exodus chapter 34, the Lord is speaking to Moses and he declares this, I am the Lord. The Lord is a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and truth, 
maintaining faith, full love to a thousand generations, and forgiving their iniquity and rebellion and their sin. But I will not leave the guilty unpunished. And so we've got a big dilemma there. If God is light and he will not leave the guilty unpunished, and every single one of us certainly is guilty of sin, then how is it possible for us to be in relationship uh, with God? And we turn to chapter 2 of 1 John, and in 1 John chapter 2, in the first two verses, it explains to us, how, how can I, a sinful person, once again experience a restored, reconciled relationship with God? How, how can I be in His presence? How can I be in relationship with Him? And uh, how, how can you and I experience reconciliation and forgiveness and relationship with a holy and just and powerful God. Look what verses 1 through 2 of 1 John chapter 2 say. John writes, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He, Jesus, is the propitiation of our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And so basically, in these passages, we read that Jesus, in verse 1, it says, is our advocate. And then in verse 2, um, how can Jesus be our advocate? Verse 2, it says, because Jesus is our atonement. So Jesus is our advocate, Jesus is our atonement, and because of that, you and I can experience a restored relationship with God. Let's explain both of these things. What does it mean when Jesus is our advocate? And what does it mean in verse 2 when it says Jesus is the propitiation of our sins? A couple of things before we dive into that uh, that we see at the beginning of verse 1 in chapter 2. First of all, John starts off with sort of a peculiar uh, title. He, he calls us my little children. And in our kind of culture, that would, that would seem to be an address to, that you would say to someone who's immature, who's needy. But that is not what John means at all. Um, basically, what uh, John is meaning is this. Um, this term, actually, he uses it seven times in the book of 1 John. And simply by that phrase, my little children, what John is referring to is it's a term of love and concern. So basically, what he is saying is, when he says, my little children... You are the one I dearly love. Um, I, I want to treat you like a father would treat his very own child with love and compassion and concern. And then he says, I, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. What does he mean by that? Uh, basically, the best way to translate that is, I'm writing these things um, that I have just written in chapter 1 and what's going to follow. I'm writing these things so you will not treat sin lightly because sin is not to be taken lightly. Um, you're, you're not to be thinking that sin is no big deal because in chapter 1 he talked about uh, fellowship with the Father and having uh, the forgiveness of sins. And he says even though your sins are forgiven, you should not treat sin lightly. Christians are saved from sin, not to sin, as one person wrote. Christians are saved from sin, not to sin. And so that is what the writer of John, 1 John, John himself, is explaining. And then the rest of verse 1, we see this wonderful word, advocate. Jesus is our advocate. It says, if anyone does sin which every single one of us does. We have an advocate with the Father, the Heavenly Father. His name is Jesus Christ, the righteous. Um, and so the word advocate is used to describe Jesus. So those of us who are followers of Christ, who by faith have asked Christ into our lives and we're following Christ by faith through His grace, um, Jesus is our advocate. Now, in John chapter 14 through 16, uh, that word advocate is used to uh, basically apply to the Holy Spirit. Um, but
But the word translated here, advocate, is one who comes alongside someone. So if you can imagine a person who comes alongside and, and basically just puts their arm around them, comes alongside of them during a time of need. But in this passage, it also means another thing. It means not only coming to our side during our time of need, but in referring to Jesus as our advocate, it also means that it's a person who comes to your defense. Uh, if, if you are a person who needs a defense about something, it's a person who comes alongside you to your defense and speaks on your behalf. Uh, think about this. In John chapter 14 through 16, the Holy Spirit is referred to as our advocate, and here, Jesus is referred to our advocate. What does that mean? It means good news. You and I have two advocates. Uh, number one, you have an advocate in your life that indwells you when you place your faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit. He speaks on your behalf uh, to God and convicts you of your sin. But you also have a second advocate in heaven, Jesus Christ, who speaks to God on your behalf. As the author of Hebrews uh, chapter 7, verse 25, it says, Our high priest and advocate is Jesus Christ. He always lives to make intercession for us. So the Holy Spirit within us is an advocate, and Jesus in the heavenly place is our advocate before the heavenly Father. We have one who pleads our cause before a holy God. Yeah, this person is Jesus Christ. That's amazing that we have someone, Jesus, who speaks to the Heavenly Father on our behalf as our advocate. But how can this be? How can Jesus plead our cause before a holy God when our sin has separated us from God? How is this possible? We stand condemned because of our sin before a holy God. How can Jesus stand as our advocate? Well, that's answered in verse 2. In seven words in my translation, in seven words, verse 2, it says he, referring to Jesus, is the propitiation for our sins. He, referring to Jesus, is our propitiation for our sins. How can he be his advocate? Because he has paid the penalty for our sins so that we can be reconciled to God. Um, another translation, that, that word propitiation seems very, very troubling because you don't hear it a whole lot uh, in our day and age. But it is a big deal. It is a very, very important word because it is one of the cornerstones of the Christian faith. Uh, it's also um, translated atoning sacrifice. And basically what propitiation means is there is a sacrifice that has been made that turns away God's holy, righteous wrath towards sin. It's a sacrifice that turns away God's holy wrath towards us and basically places that wrath on something else. Therefore, since God's wrath is turned away and applied to someone else, propitiation also means that God is now acting favorable, propitious, towards us. And so what propitiation basically means is the wrath that God has towards sin is turned away from us and turned on to something else. And as a result, God now can look upon us as forgiven and as our sins being atoned for. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, very familiar verse, it, it describes what happens when propitiation takes place. For our sake he made him, Christ, to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So God's wrath is turned away from us. Who was it turned upon? It was turned upon Jesus Christ, the Son. Uh, Christ became our substitute when he shed his blood on the cross. He became our substitute, and he paid the penalty for all of our sins 
during those three hours of darkness when he hung on the cross. And so God's lightning bolt wrath and justice towards sin was satisfied because Christ paid the penalty for our sins. You know, many of us enjoy a, a good TV show and it includes a, a good trial lawyer and uh, in the past especially there were all sorts of very popular uh, TV shows um, that uh, included a courtroom and a trial and a lawyer. Um, some of us old fogies can remember some of these. Perry Mason, Matlock, Law and Order, Boston Legal, L.A. Law, and then more recently Suits, The Practice, and then a few years back uh, the, the Naval uh, Lawyer Show, JAG. Um, David Allen, in his book, does a wonderful job of showing us basically what happens as a result of us experiencing the propitiation of our sins because of right Christ does. And he, and he sort of gives us a hypothetical courtroom scene that involves the Heavenly Father, the Son, and Satan, and us. Listen to this. I think it's pretty good. In a courtroom scene, there are at least four people that are always involved in the courtroom. The judge the prosecutor, the defense attorney, and then the defendant. Uh, picture in your mind God being the judge in this heavenly courtroom. The prosecutor is Satan himself, and you are the accused one. The attorney for your defense, Jesus, is the one that will intercede with the judge on your behalf. What a picture this is. Have you ever read Revelation chapter 12, verse 10? It's an interesting statement that is made about Satan. He is called the great accuser of Christians, of followers of Christ. And he accuses them before our heavenly Father, God. Day and night, it says, the accuser makes accusations against us. He is called the accuser of the brethren, the prosecuting attorney. And then there is the defense attorney, Jesus Christ. Now, I'm going to put my own name in this hypothetical situation. When Dane shouts sins, I can imagine that Satan rushes quickly to accuse me before the Heavenly Father. I can almost hear him as he quotes scriptures concerning the penalty for sin and how it is punishable by eternal death. And that Dane's shout should be put to eternal death. Then I imagine my defense attorney, the Lord Jesus Christ, saying, Yes, Heavenly Father, Dane's shout is absolutely guilty of that sin. But Father... I went to the cross and died for that very sin and every one of his sins. When he was a freshman in college, Dane Shout placed his faith in me and my atonement was applied to him and his sins were completely forgiven. I put my robe of righteousness on him and he is covered by my blood and he is forgiven because he is my child because of his faith in me. Now, in the modern legal world, the defense attorney defends the defendant on the merits of the defendant. But in the heavenly court, as John would say, the merit on part of the accused is entirely absent. The defendant can't stand for himself. But all of the merit is on the part of the advocate. And Jesus Christ advocates to the Heavenly Father on Dane Shout's part. For those of you who are intrigued by courtrooms even more, listen to this. It's sort of a, you got to think about it a little bit. In the legal world, it is not permissible for any attorney who is involved in the case to be related to the judge. However, in heaven's court, 
it is perfectly legal. Jesus, the Son, loves the Father, and the Father loves the Son. And the Son serves as the advocate and judge because Jesus, our advocate, can stand face to face with God as Son in relationship and fellowship because He is divine. In verse 1, you see this phrase, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. That little phrase, with the Father, is actually an important phrase. With the Father literally can be translated face to face. And so when John is saying we have this advocate who is with the Father, it basically means this advocate of ours is in deep personal relationship with God himself. He goes on by saying, in the legal world, it is also impermissible for the defense attorney to be related to the defendant. But again, in heaven's court, it is perfectly legal. Jesus can represent us as our advocate because he is fully human. He calls us brothers and sisters in Hebrews 2. And as Hebrews 4 states, in every respect has been tempted just as we are, yet is without sin. Sometimes we may think that Jesus does not understand our predicament, does not understand um, the sin that we are battling, but Jesus is fully qualified to serve as our advocate when we sin because he understands what it means to be tempted in every way. As man, he too was tempted, but never sinned. Jesus' intercession for us is not temporary. It's never interrupted. Though accomplished in time, it is eternally valued valid and continuous. Robert Murray McShane wrote that when he sins, he also says this, I feel that when I have sinned, there is an immediate reluctance on my part to even go to Christ. I am so ashamed to go to him because of the shame and the guilt that I feel for my sin. But he says that is the furthest thing from the truth. The scriptures would tell me that I am believing in a lie if I am ashamed and guilty to approach my advocate. But instead, we need to be made, the moment we are aware of our sin, we should flee and run to our advocate because Jesus Christ has already paid the penalty for of us. At the end of verse 2, it says this, He is the propitiation of our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Your sins, my sins, everyone else's sins, Christ has paid the penalty for them. Uh, no matter how tarnished your record is, no matter how sinful you might think you are, Christ has paid the penalty for your sin, and he pleads with you. The Holy Spirit pleads with you by faith in me. Come to me, experience my grace because I've already paid the penalty for your sin. And by faith, place your trust in me as your Savior, the only Savior because the only one who has paid the penalty for your sins. Friend, you can do that today if you've never done that. Just acknowledge what Christ has done for you. Acknowledge that you are a sinner, that you, you need a Savior. Because you cannot reconcile yourself back to God through your own efforts, your own religion, your own morality. No, Christ has already paid the penalty for your sins. And because he has done that, he is worthy of your devotion. He is worthy of your trust. He is worthy of you to give your life to him. So by faith, it's a free gift. Simply go, run to this Savior. Treasure him and give your life to him. You can simply do that right now by just simply entrusting Jesus Christ as your Savior because he is the only one that has paid your penalty for your sins. If you have done that, please let myself or someone know that uh, you would either desire to do that or have already done that because I would love to talk to you about how you can begin this wonderful journey with your advocate, Jesus Christ. Christ is our substitute. Christ is our advocate. And so we do not have to fear when we sin because the penalty has already been paid. God bless you. I hope the rest of your day is filled 
with exalting Christ Jesus as your Savior. Thank you for listening today. Amen. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How He gave His life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about His groaning Of His precious blood's atoning then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He saw me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him. And all my Of his cleansing power revealing How he made the lame to walk again And caused the blind to see And then I cried, dear Jesus Come and heal my broken spirit And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory Oh, victory my Savior forever. He saw me and bought me with His redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew Him, and all my love is due. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing floor. I heard about he has built for me in glory and i heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea about the angels singing and the old redemption story and some sweet day i'll sing Yeah.